The Chronicles of Pridane by Lloyd Alexander. Book Two, The Black Cauldron. Chapter 13, The Plan. The door slammed shut behind them, and once again the companions found themselves outside the cottage. Well, I like that, I longly cried indignantly. After all their talk of dear little Dolben and sweet little Dolben, they've turned us out. Better out than into, if you take my meaning, said the bard. A flam is always kind to animals, but somehow I can't bring myself to feel I should like to actually become one. No, oh, no, Gurgi cried fervently, and Gurgi too wants to stay as he is, bold and clever. Tarn turned back to the cottage and began pounding on the door. They must listen to us, he declared. They didn't even take time to think it over. But the door did not open, and though he ran to the window and rapped long and loud, the enchantresses did not show themselves again. I'm afraid that's your answer, said Fluiter. They've said all they intend to say, and perhaps it's for the best. And I have the uneasy feeling that all that knocking and thumping might. Oh, uh, well, you don't know what those, uh, ladies get upset at noises. We can't just go away, Tarn replied. The cauldron is in their hands, and friends of Dalbin or not, there's no telling what they'll do with it. I fear them, and I distrust them. You heard the way the one called Orgok was talking. Yes, I can well imagine what she'd have done to Dolben. He shook his head gravely. This is what Gwydion warned against. Whoever has the cauldron can be a mortal threat to Prydain if they choose to be. At least Eladir hasn't found it, Ilanway said. That's something to be grateful for. If you want the advice of one who is, after all, the oldest one here, said the bard. I think we should do well to hurry home and let Dolben and Gwydion attend to the matter. After all, Dolben should know how to deal with those three. No, Taran answered, that I will not do. We should lose precious days in travel. The huntsmen failed to get the cauldron back, but who knows what Arryn will attempt next. No, we dare not leave the thing here. For once, declared Ilan White, I agree. We've come this far and we shall have to go on to the end. I don't trust those enchantresses either. They wouldn't sleep if they thought we had the cauldron. I shall certainly have nightmares if I think of them with it. Not to mention Arryn. I believe no one, human or otherwise, should have that much power. She shuddered. Ugh, there go the ants up my back again. Yes, well, it's true, Fluider began. But the fact remains, they have that wretched pot, and we don't. They're there, and we're here. And it looks very much as though it will stay that way. Tarn was thoughtful a moment. When Arryn wouldn't give the cauldron back to them, he said, they went and took it. Now, since they won't let us have the cauldron, I see only one way. We shall have to take it. Steal it? cried the bard. His worried expression changed rapidly and his eyes brightened. I mean, he dropped his voice to a whisper, steal it? Now there's a thought, he went on eagerly. Never occurred to me. Yes, yes, that's the way, he added with excitement. Now that has some style and flair to it. One difficulty, Alanway said. We don't know where they've hidden the cauldron, and they evidently aren't going to let us in to find out. Taran frowned. I wish Dolly were here. He'd have no trouble at all. I don't know. There must be some way. They told us we could stay the night, he continued. That gives us from now until dawn. Come, let's not stand in front of their cottage or they'll know we're up to something. Ordu spoke of a shed. The companions led their horses to the side of the hill where a low, dilapidated building tottered shakily on the turf. It was bare and bleak and the autumn wind whistled through the chinks in the earthen wall. The bard stamped his feet and beat his arms. Chilly spot to plan anything, he remarked. Those enchantresses may have a lovely view of the marshes, but it's a cold one. I wish we had some straw, Ilanway said, or anything to keep us warm. We'll freeze before we have a chance to think of anything at all. Gurgi will find straw, Gurgi suggested. He scurried out of the shed and ran toward the chicken roost. Tarn paced back and forth. We'll have to get into the cottage as soon as they're asleep. He shook his head and fingered the brooch at his throat. But how? 
A Dayon's clasp has given me no idea. The dreams I had of the cauldron are without meaning to me. If I could only understand them. Suppose you dozed off right now, said Fluter helpfully, and slept as fast as you could. Uh, as hard as you could, I mean. You might find the answer. I'm not sure, replied Tarn. It doesn't quite work that way. It should be a lot easier than boring a hole through the hill, said the bard. Which was my next suggestion? We could block up their chimney and smoke them out, Ilanwe said. Then one of us could sneak into the cottage. No, she added. On second thought, I'm afraid anything we might put down their chimney, well, they could very likely put something worse up. Besides, they don't have a chimney, so we shall have to forget that idea. Gurgi, meantime, had returned with a huge armload of straw from the chicken roost, and the companions gratefully began heaping it on the clay floor. While Gurgi went off again to fetch another load, Taran looked dubiously at the straggly pile. I suppose I could try to dream, he said without much hope. I certainly haven't a better suggestion. We can bed you down very nicely, said Fluider. And while you're dreaming, the rest of us will be thinking too. That way we can all be working after our own fashion. I don't mind telling you, he added. I wish I had a day on's brooch. Sleep? I wouldn't need to be asked twice. I'm weary to my bones. Tarn, still unsure, made ready to settle himself on the straw when Gurgi reappeared, wide-eyed and trembling. The creature was so upset he could only gasp and gesture. Tarn sprang to his feet. What is it? he cried. Gurgi beckoned them toward the chicken roost and the companions hurried after him. The agitated Gurgi led them into the wattle and daub building, then slunk back, terrified. He pointed to the far corner. There, in the midst of the straw, stood a cauldron. It was squat and black and half as tall as a man. Its ugly mouth gaped wide enough to hold a human body. The rim of the cauldron was crooked and battered, its sides dented and scarred. On its lips and on the curve of its belly lay dark brown flecks and stains which Taran knew were not rust. A long, thick handle was braced with a heavy bar. Two heavy rings, like the links of a great chain, were set in either side. Though of iron, the cauldron seemed alive, grim and brooding with ancient evil. The empty mouth caught the chill breeze, and a hushed muttering rose from the cauldron's depths, like the lost voices of the tormented dead. It is the black crochin, Tarn whispered in fear and awe. He well understood Gurgi's terror, for the very sight of the cauldron was enough to make him feel an icy hand clutching his heart. He turned away, hardly daring to look at it any longer. Fluider's face was pale. Ilanwe put a hand to her mouth. In the corner, Gurgi shivered pitifully. Though he himself was had found it, he gave no joyous yelps of triumph. Instead, he sank deeper into the straw and tried to make himself as small as possible. Yes, well, I suppose it is indeed, replied Fluider, swallowing hard. On the other hand, he added hopefully, Perhaps it's not. They did say they had a number of other cauldrons and kettles lying about. I mean, we shouldn't want to make a mistake. It is the Crochin, Tarn said. I have dreamed of it. And even if I had not, I would know it still, for I can sense the evil in it. I too, muttered Ilanwe. It is full of death and suffering. I understand why Gwydion wants to destroy it. She turned to Tarn. You were right in seeking it without delay. Ilanwe added with a shudder. I take back all the things I said. The Crochin must be destroyed as soon as possible. Yes, uh, Fluider sighed. I'm afraid this is the Crochin itself. Why couldn't it have been a nice little kettle instead of this ugly hulking brute? However, he went on taking a deep breath. Let's snatch it. A flam never hesitates. No, cried Tarn, putting out a hand to restrain the bard. We dare not take it in broad daylight, and we mustn't stay here, or they'll know we've found it. We'll come back after nightfall with the horses and drag it away. For now, we'd better keep to the shed and act as if nothing has happened. The companions quickly returned to the shed. Once away from the Crochin, Gurgi regained some of his spirits. Oh, crafty Gurgi found it, he cried. Oh, yes, he always finds what is lost. He has found piggies, and now he finds a great cauldron of wicked doings and brewings. Kind master will honor humble Gurgi. 
Nevertheless, his face wrinkled with fear. Tarn gave Gurgi a comforting pat on the shoulder. Yes, old friend, he said. You have helped us more than once, but I never would have imagined they'd have hidden the crochin in an empty chicken roost under a pile of dirty straw. He shook his head. I think they'd want to guard it better. Not at all, said the bard. They were very clever. They put it in one of the first places anybody would look. Knowing quite well, it was so easy, nobody would ever think of looking there. Perhaps, Tarn said, he frowned. Or perhaps, he added, unable to stifle the dread suddenly filling him, they meant us to find it. In the shed, the companions tried to sleep, knowing the night to come would be one of hard and dangerous labor. Fluter and Gurgi dozed briefly. Ilanwe huddled in her cloak with some straw piled around her. Tarn was too restless and uneasy even to close his eyes. He sat silently, in his hands a long coil of rope he had taken from what little gear remained of the companions. They had decided to sling the cauldron between the two horses and make their way from the marshes into the sh safe shelter of the forest where they would destroy the Crochin. No sign of life came from the cottage. At nightfall, however, a candle suddenly glowed in the window. Tarn rose quietly and moved stealthily out of the shed. Clinging to the shadows, he made his way to the low building and peered in. For a moment he stood there amazed, unable to move. Then he turned and raced back to the others as quickly as he could. I saw them in there, he whispered, rousing the bard and Gurgi. They aren't the same ones at all. What? cried Ilanwe. Are you sure you didn't stumble on a different cottage? Of course I didn't, retorted Tarn. And if you don't believe me, go and look for yourself. They aren't the same. There are three of them, yes, but they're different. One of them was carding wool, one of them was spinning, and the third was weaving. I suppose, really, said the bard. It passes the time for them. There's little enough to do in the middle of this dismal bog. I shall indeed have to see for myself, Ilanwe declared. There's nothing so strange about weaving, but beyond that I can't make any sense of what you say. With Taran leading, the companions stole cautiously to the window. It was as he had said. Inside the cottage, three figures went about their tasks, but not one of them resembled Ordu, Orwin, or Orgok. They're beautiful, whispered Ilanwe. I've heard of hags trying to disguise themselves as beautiful maidens, murmured the bard. But I've never heard of beautiful maidens wanting to disguise themselves as hags. It isn't natural, and I don't mind telling you, it makes me edgy. I think we'd better seize the cauldron and be gone. I don't know who they are, said Tarin, but I fear they are more powerful than we could even guess. Somehow we've fallen on something. I don't know what. It troubles me. Yes, we must take the cauldron as soon as we can. We shall wait until they're asleep. If they sleep, said the bard. Now that I've seen this, nothing would surprise me. Not even if they hung by their toes all night, like bats. For a long time, Tarn feared the bard was right and that the enchantresses might not sleep at all. The companions took turns watching the cottage, and it was not until almost dawn that the candle finally winked out. In an agony of waiting, Tarn still delayed. Soon, a loud snoring rose from within. They must have gone back to themselves again, remarked the bard. I can't imagine beautiful ladies snoring like that. No, it's Orgark. I'd recognize that snort anywhere. Oh. In the still shadows of the false dawn, the companions hastened to the chicken roost where Ilanwe ventured to light her bauble. The crochin squatted in its corner, black and baleful. Hurry now, Tarn ordered, taking hold of the handle. Fluid and Ilanwe, pick up those rings. And Gurgi, lift the other side. We'll haul it out and rope it to the horses. Ready? All lift together. The companions gave a mighty heave, then nearly fell to the ground. The cauldron had not moved. It's heavier than I thought, said Tarin. Try again. He made to shift his grip on the handle, but his hands would not come free. In a spurt of fear, he tried to pull away. It was in vain. I see, muttered the bard. I seem to be caught on something. So am I, Ilanwe cried, struggling to tear her hands loose. Oh, and Gurgi is caught, howled the terrified Gurgi. Oh, sorrow, he cannot move. 
Desperately, the companions flung themselves back and forth, fighting against the mute iron enemy. Tarn wrenched and tugged until he sobbed for lack of strength. Ilanwe had dropped in exhaustion, her hands still on the heavy ring. Once again, Tarn strained to break free. The, brack, the black crochin held him fast. A figure in a long night robe appeared at the doorway. It's Ordu, cried the bard. We'll be totes for sure.